Good evening and welcome to the American University Museum at the Katzen Art Center. The museum is celebrating the opening of the new Hall of Science on our campus this fall with an exhibition presented by the Alper Initiative for Washington Art titled Reveal, the Art of Reimagining Scientific Discovery. Reveal makes the point that the A must be kept in the middle of STEM education. Art sparks imagination, creativity, and curiosity in ways we believe naturally align with and reinforce science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So the exhibition reveal is the result of a collaboration between our two participants in tonight's webinar, the artist Rebecca Kamen and the curator Sarah Tangy. I first knew Rebecca Kamen as a sculptor of enigmatic objects, I hate to say how many years ago. <laughs> Uh, her practice now includes painting and presentations that are informed by observation and wide ranging research into cosmology, history, philosophy, and the search for common threads that flow across various scientific fields to capture and reimagine what scientists see. Her list of awards and honors is quite lengthy and diverse. From her selection as a Salzburg Global Seminar Fellow, her subject was the neuroscience of art, what are the sources of creativity and innovation, to receiving the most prestigious Pollock Krasner Foundation Fellowship. She is a professor emerita of art at Northern Virginia Community College and currently serves as artist in residence in the Computational Neuroscience Initiative and the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Pennsylvania. Sarah Tangy is an independent curator and arts writer based in Washington, DC. She holds a BA in Fine Arts from Georgetown University and an MA in Art History from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's held numerous positions in the art world. I won't go into all of them, but at the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition Service, and most recently, and uh, for a lengthy time, in the Art and Embassies Program for the US Department of State. And she contributes to the ongoing exhibition program for the American Center for Physics. So let me first thank the family of Carolyn Alper with her legion of friends for keeping alive the vision of the Alper Initiative for Washington Art. The pandemic has made a physical gallery talk impossible at this time, but the museum is open to the public without appointment from 11 to four Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. That's progress. We hope and look forward to seeing you here. Thank you for coming. Hold on to your seats. You're in for a treat. I give you Rebecca Kamen and Sarah Tangy. Thank you. So Rebecca, I'll let you start uh, sharing your screen. Great. So uh, I want to thank you, Jack, for those super duper introductions. And I want to welcome, add my welcome to everyone who's at tonight's talk. To start, I want to acknowledge the indigenous peoples on whose land I live and speak from. I also want to extend a very, very warm and heartfelt thanks to the entire staff at the museum for their ongoing support in making this exhibition and catalog possible. You guys have just been fabulous. Tonight's format's gonna to be super simple. After I give a brief overview, Rebecca is going to present a PowerPoint detailing her practice and how, and how the show came to be. Uh, then we'll have about 20 minutes or so left over for Q&A. And we encourage you to use that button because Re Rebecca and I are very interested in hearing your thoughts. So at its core, this is an exhibition about curiosity. What is revealed when curiosity is your guide and nature your muse? How curiosity can spur scientific discovery and artistic production and perhaps most importantly, how curiosity can be a way to navigate plight and offer unexpected growth. 
Reveal is also about, as Jack mentioned, transdisciplinary collaboration and making new connections across seemingly disparate fields of inquiry. Throughout the show, we glimpse into Rebecca's extensive collaborations with scientists, with poets, and with performing artists. We experience her personal journey of turning crisis into opportunity and her desire to inspire others with a message of beauty and hope. So what does a show about curiosity and collaboration look like? Rebecca and I worked on this project for about three years. And thankfully, we've known each other much longer. And our friendship provided a platform for the show's development. Like so many, when the pandemic hit, we had to go virtual. Rebecca from Philadelphia and I from DC. So instead of actual physical studio visits, we got into FaceTiming each other on a regular basis, initially to hone the exhibition's thematic focus. Then we started meeting so that Rebecca could show me the works of art, the paintings, the sculptures she was making, and we could have like a back and forth about these works. And then towards the end, we were, we were meeting over FaceTime to finalize the selection and the layout. What I loved the most about working with Rebecca throughout this was how she would constantly floor me with unexpected new options because something she had just learned had sparked yet another insight. So it was, it was a real adventure for three years putting the show together with Rebecca. In terms of the conceptual framework, we, wanted to, we decided to recreate Rebecca's process of discovery to maximize accessibility for all different types of audiences. We wanted to show the, poet, uh, the various sources of inspiration behind her poetic interpretations of scientific research. And we wanted to convey how she transforms external and internal conditions, both of which are invisible to the naked eye, into intimate works of art that are none, and they're abstract, well, as you will see, I would consider them abstractions, but they are nonetheless rooted in actual phenomena. Bottom line is we put together a show and I wrote an essay without ever seeing the works fully installed. So now, Rebecca, if you'll go to the next slide, please. So here we are on the first Saturday that the show opened to the public. And we were thrilled along with Jack and celebrating just having a joyous experience about seeing everything fully installed. Next slide, please. So I wanted to end my little overview with this slide. It brings together two seminal events in Rebecca's life. On the left, you see the cover of a book called The Sense of Wonder, which Rebecca's parents gifted her as a child and had inscribed, we hope you never lose your sense of wonder. And believe me, she never has. In 2005, I asked her if she'd be interested in participating in a show that I was curating at the American Center for Physics, marking the 100th anniversary of Einstein's discovery or formulation of the theory of, of relativity. And I explained to her that I needed her to make 16 sculptures in about six weeks. And much to my amazement, she said yes, and was also a huge relief. And that was the start truly of Rebecca's long history now of collaborating with scientists. So now I turn it over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Well, I think one of the most unusual things for me um, about this exhibition was um, my trip to American University um, for a week residency, which on the second day um, started in a crisis. I was rushed to Georgetown Hospital um, on that second day, only to find out I had a brain tumor. 
Um, the good news is it, it was, uh, it could be operated on. Um, and the better news was at the end of the week when they released me, I was still able to do at least one lecture. Um, so that was really good news. But what I realized was during my recovery from that uh, uh, brain surgery, I felt a compelling need to try to document this awful double and triple vision I was experiencing. So I went into my studio and I did a series of paintings <clears throat> that could capture what I was experiencing. And um, as a result of that crisis uh, um, situation, they provided um, artwork for this exhibition, which I will discuss um, a little further along. Um, about two or three months later after the surgery, um, we were in the pandemic. And it was interesting to me, the word apocalypse came up um, when, when reading about what a pandemic was. But when I looked at the definition um, of apocalypse, it, it dealt with what um, a prophetic revelation, something being revealed. And for me, this whole experience um, of first the brain surgery and then the pandemic took me on this extraordinary journey of discovery. So Sarah and I talked about how we should um, start the exhibition and she, um, we both love the idea of using some of the artifacts that I surround myself with in my studio and create what's called a Kunstkammer in German, in English, a cabinet of curiosity. And what's been really wonderful about having this set up at the Katzen Center, the few times I've been on campus, I've watched people go over and look at these objects and just get totally enchanted by them. And then they start sharing stories about similar objects that they have. So for me, it was just a wonderful way to do an exhibition that really explored the notion of curiosity. Um, these are some close-ups of some objects. Uh, this photograph was shot by Sarah. I love it because it has this really rich reflective nature about it, which to me is what happens when I hold these objects or look at these objects. And then these are two of my favorite objects. Um, the one on the left represents uh, what's called Kepler's obsession of, of him taking nesting polyhedras. And the good news is we have this beautiful model. The bad news is what it represents is what he thought was the distance between the different planets. That wasn't true. But in this situation, it is juxtaposed next to this absolutely beautiful model of the coronavirus that was uh, loaned to us from uh, National Institute of Health. So what you're seeing here is complexity at both a micro and macro level. As we move through the exhibition um, on the left wall, you see um, data from a, a wonderful collaboration that I continue to have with uh, complex systems researchers at University of Pennsylvania. And basically what they do is they um, observe knowledge networks and how people are curious. And my particular form is what they call the dancer. And what that means is when I'm looking at different things in, uh, for networking, um, for creating my artwork, I literally dance across different disciplines and bring bits and pieces from all these different places that I traverse to create my artwork. And so what you're seeing, that thing that looks like a fur ball is actually all the knowledge networking that went in to creating all the work in this exhibition. And so we have a static version and then there is a dynamic version um, on the monitor. To the right of that is work that has been inspired by what I call warming or global warming, which in 2019 was something that I was researching and thinking about. And then you move into the main gallery area. Um, what I wanna show you here, this actually is the dynamic version um, of my artistic process and how I 
explain this to the scientists was I actually put together PowerPoints that showed all the different things that I look at that inform my artwork. This particular wall is a very powerful wall for me because it represents that crisis opportunity moment that I discussed prior. Um, one of the ways that I felt that I could make the pandemic less terrifying for me was to reach out to my proscopists. And I was very fortunate. There is a wonderful group, um, part of National Institute of Health um, at the Rocky Mountain Lab in Montana. And I'm shouting out to them because I know several of them are in the audience tonight. Um, and they were very generous in terms of sharing their microscopy images with me. And that way I felt like, you know, if I could see it, I could try to understand uh, its significance to me as a human being, as an artist. I also juxtaposed this with research um, with a wonderful uh, heliophysicist at AU, Silvinia Goldini. And what she does is she's researching corona, but at the macro level. So what I was trying to do with this wall of artwork, both painting and three-dimensional work, is to create a dialogue between this notion of corona at both the micro and macro level. This is a, a beautiful visualization um, of Sylvania's um, research. And actually she was one of the only artists, or I'm sorry, one of the only scientists I got to meet the day before um, I was rushed to the hospital. And we just had just an incredible dialogue which continues to be an ongoing dialogue about her research and how it is manifesting into my artwork. So what happened was I became totally fascinated by that word Corona and just this extraordinary dynamic that's between Corona solar emissions with what we call solar flares and the corona spike protein. So basically these are very two similar dynamics, but both one at the micro level, one at the macro level. So for me, it became just compost. It enabled me to create art that I felt really could explore these incredible discoveries I was making. And so what you're seeing on the right, I'm gonna activate this. This is what I had to do so Sarah could see the work. I mean, she could see a flat photograph, but I started to become a videographer, which I've never done before. So excuse my lack of technology, but this at least enabled her to be able to see what I was describing and what I was creating. This image, um, is on the first day that the exhibition opened. Um, as you can see um, on the left side, uh, I'm sorry, on the right side is some of the artwork that developed between di dialogues. The sculptures are with dialogues I had with scientists. The paintings are paintings that were created during my double vision period. And Sarah and I decided it would be really exciting to juxtapose these, this, because they, they actually deal with complexity systems, which is something I'm very interested in. My own personal complexity system in my brain, and then scientists who explore a complexity system in their work. Why don't you, uh, did you mention already that they're called reveries and... No, but you can go ahead, sir. No, no, you're the artist. I mean, you should explain because I think, I mean, it might, it might almost be counterintuitive to talk about draw, you know, paintings made while you're experiencing double or triple vision to call them reveries. And I, I loved that, but you should explain that maybe. Well, that title came to me after I got my vision was restored. And I love the idea because reveries are about these moments of insight. And for me, I felt every, and I would do a painting a day. I felt like every single day, this painting would provide um, insight 
into what was going on in my brain. I couldn't take an iPhone photograph of that, obviously, to capture right. that. But one way I could capture it is from it coming from my eye through my hand to a piece of paper. So to me, this body of paintings is very precious because it's captured a moment of time that started as a crisis, but in retrospect became an incredible opportunity for knowing. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is uh, one example of what happened when I finally um, recovered from my surgery. I reached back out to these scientists who unfortunately I was supposed to meet with but couldn't during the week that I was in uh, DC to share their um, research. This particular uh, woman uh, works with the cerebellum. And what was interesting to me about the cerebellum it's like a miniature brain. It's got two hemispheres, which I've tried to capture with this sculpture. It also has the greatest diversity of neurons. And as someone who has studied neuroscience, not as a neuroscientist, but as a curious person at the National Institute of Health, this was very fascinating to me. This is a piece um, by Nate Harshman um, and, and Nate and I just had this incredible ongoing dialogue um, during the pandemic, uh, he deals a lot with quantum mechanics. And so this particular research he does is called quantum quilts. And I love that notion of a scientist calling something scientific a quilt, because for me, it brings up all kinds of possibilities of, of what that's about. And uh, actually, I was scheduled to do a physics colloquium when I was rushed to the hospital, but I got to do it a year later, um, which was very wonderful because I got to share some of the development of the work. And this is um, Sarah, um, our curator, acting as model. And this, the other great thing about this, this gives you a sense of scale of, of these pieces called illuminations. These are some of the last sculptures that were created for this exhibition. Um, and they developed basically because of these incredible dialogues I was having with scientists and the realization that things at both the macro and micro level, so much of the patterns of these phenomena deal with geometry. I'm gonna stop you again, because okay. I, I think um, if you go back there, yeah. Because um, I think by now people have gotten a sense of the paintings, the reveries, and then a sense of the sculptures. And what, one of the things that I also find pretty fascinating is that they're both made out of mylar. And you might not necessarily guess that right away. And the few times I've been in the gallery, people definitely go up and want to know what the medium is. And going to just jumping back now or certainly to the illuminations um, it's you start off with a sheet of mylar and I think it's kind of interesting because when I first saw them again because we were facetiming I, I I saw these amazing topographical landscapes and I couldn't tell if it was a close-up like a forest floor or something truly cosmic but I didn't really understand that because I I'm going to say hinge, you correct me, but because they're hinge, when you put them down on those little pedestals, they start doing their own thing. They, <laughs> and you see, you know, they each sort of assume the pose they want to assume. And then you have like a, don't even, like a see-through transparent painting on the inside. It's a whole revelation of what goes on in the inside, as opposed to when they're sort of close when you know those that first photo or jpeg you sent me i didn't realize it kind of opened yeah these are painted flat and they're um they're based on the uh, asasahedron because a lot of the viruses and i'll talk about that in a little bit um the the geometric um configuration of the coronavirus and a lot of viruses is the asasahedron so I, I wanted to work with that flat and then um, the painting was done flat, then it scored and folded and bent um, to transform into something very different. 
Um, and what I imagine what happens with viruses, you know, how they start transforming into other things. So what you're seeing here in this image uh, is my process of discovery. Um, at the very top is a beautiful image from the Rocky Mountain Lab um, of the coronavirus. They were some of the first labs in the United States to actually uh, do microscopy um, on the, on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. And then below it, you see the quantum quilt, um, quantum mechanics. So you see things at micro, macro. Um, on the lower right-hand corner is, is a scientist in uh, Great Britain that deals with um, the geometry of viruses and, and how um, things are created or pathways are created uh, for vaccines. But the one thing everything has in common here is what's up in the upper right-hand corner. And this is a beautiful model of uh, MC Escher's uh, devil and angel. And what was significant about um, him, about Escher is his notion of tessellation and that has impacted so many scientists. So I love the fact that an artist is responsible for presenting a notion that has now impacted scientists in terms of telling the story of their science. And then this wonderful quote about geometry draws the soul towards truth that really felt so much like what was happening during my journey with this artwork. And these are two different illuminations. You can see one's more contained, the one on the left. The one on the right is, wanted to, I wanted it to be contained, but it had very different ideas <laughs> exactly. when I placed it. So art, as you know, art always has a mind of its own, just like the artist. <laughs> And then um, the last part of this exhibition, um, and, and some of you in the audience who know me know, I always like to take on major scientific phenomena and create some type of environment um, and make it accessible, humanize it, make it poetic. And I felt very compelled to do that with the coronavirus, but I wasn't sure how. And then one day um, I ran across this SIR model. And I love the fact how scientists use models to try to make the invisible visible, just like we do as artists. And so what I decided to do was um, to create an installation that you can't walk through like I've done with many of my others, but to create one that you can stand in front of and get a sense uh, of what your experience uh, and your understanding of the coronavirus is. So it's called silent spread and it reflects traces and symbolizes, as you can see on the screen, the migratory pattern of the coronavirus. And I was very fortunate because when I was in Salzburg um, at this uh, Neuroscience of Art conference, I met a wonderful sound artist, uh, Shodakai, Telefaro, and he does a lot of, he's a beatboxer and breath artist. And I thought this would be the perfect person to create a soundscape because breathing is so much a part of what uh, has impacted us with the coronavirus. And so this is what the installation looks like. And this is what it sounds like when you stand in front of it. I'm hoping everyone can hear this. Just play this for a couple seconds. So. And the idea is for you to connect with your breath when you're standing in front of this sculpture. And so Sarah and, and, and Shodakai said to me, Shodakai was, in, was said, you absolutely have to photograph every single one of these so I can see them. So I can create, he, he created 28, because there's 28 sculptures, micro compositions. Sarah wanted to see it so she could write about it. So what you're seeing now and what you're hearing now 
is what Sarah got to see. So she'd have some idea of what this looked like in person. You can hear someone clanging in the background in the kitchen. That's the downside of doing a video like this during the pandemic. And what I'd like to do at, to end this portion or getting close to ending this portion of the presentation, a very dear friend of mine, a poet in London was kind enough to do a poetic response um, to silent spread. And it's, it's two minutes and I would like to play it for you right now. Sia, S-I-R. The 28 spheres of Cayman's harmony, susceptible, inferred, immense, actual. The electron microscopy provides images of the virus long in memories. It shows gray spinning, transforming this. I point to the past 15 months into orbs. Here they are grown enormous before you in place not within you in space. For what else can it become but the potential for indifferent attractiveness? A memory, this spread, a novel mycography. The SIR diagram is a mirror that creates a migratory pattern in the mind as one would imagine birds flying out of sight. Of birds then. The diagram is a symbol that brings nets down and what gets trapped in nets as it is expelled from our hands and rid by water is a thing that reflects, traces and symbolizes both the virus and us. The universe participates in making the artist well and an instigator. The participation of the invisible moves the virus into view. A speck, a spread, a tiny writing in the air, a diagram, an avian metaphor, an object installed to illuminate. All of this completely noiseless. And this is why I write to you in order to not speak the word and have it just be seen. And here you see exactly what Stephen has been describing. And my final slide, I have some very exciting news to share. Um, I have been selected of, uh, as one of 20 women um, that are, will be part of an exhibition that will be art by women in science called Creative Resistance. Um, that is sponsored in UNESCO. It'll be in the UNESCO headquarters in Paris in November. And the whole concept for this exhibition <clears throat> is how resilient through creativity um, we can be as a result of living through this um, pandemic. So thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing right now. Um, See if anyone has any questions. I, I have a question here. Uh, I, could, I could pull from the audience. And by the way, audience, uh, please, uh, you can address a question by going to the Q&A box there and uh, typing in what you're interested in. I have a question here. Uh, Please discuss your considerations to create art objects. Differ. Please, please discuss how your considerations to create art objects differ, if they do differ, from the choices that scientists make to create their illustrations. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, what most people don't realize is uh, both scientists and artists tell nature's story. Um, scientists do it with algorithms. Um, they do it with different kinds of charting. Um, a lot of times, one of the things that we, that what joins both of our disciplines 
is patterns. We're looking at patterns and we're interpreting patterns in very different ways. So one of the reasons I got so interested in this intersection between art and science is I re really felt that we really needed to create a bridge between this because we as human beings are living, breathing science. We live in a world around us that is living, breathing science. But if you're not trained as a scientist, most people are freaked out and terrified. But so much of our life is impacted by science. And so part of my practice is to make it beautiful, to make it accessible, to make people um, you know, come in contact with it and feel a part of it. So I hope that answered the question. Great. I, I have a question myself. Um, it's been really fun to have uh, both your show and Diane Burko's show on the first floor uh, right now. Uh, and Diane Burko's exhibition, Seeing Climate Change is really, you're both addressing catastrophe uh, in a way, but uh, in, in quite beautiful ways. Uh, Diane's looking at the planetary scale of climate change. And of course you're looking at the micro level of the brain um, but you're both working with, you know, beautiful objects, if you will, and uh, you both end up addressing the uh, coronavirus uh, in your in your shows. And uh, aside from the obvious that this was going on around you, mm -hmm. did you have a chance to talk to each other about, you know, what what you were doing, uh, what you both were doing at this time? Actually, not, and we both live in Philadelphia, which is ironic. But I think, you know, part of this is I wasn't even aware that she was going to be in the show. I've only met her once, um, very briefly at a mutual friend, artist friend of ours uh, studio. Um, so I don't really know her. We've been a little bit in email contact, but you know, what people don't realize artists usually spend a lot of time on their, on their own, you know, and especially in a pandemic, I've been really, uh, you know, Honker down in my studio. I just okay. am not taking any chances. But it gives you a lot of time for reflection. And to me, that's the really powerful thing about the um, pandemic is it's, it's given us this incredible opportunity to slow down, to stop, to reflect like the word uh, uh, apocalypse means. Um, and it also, what, what means so much to me is the shared sense of humanity, people really reaching out and helping people in a way I've never seen before in my lifetime. So, you know, I, I feel there have been some positives to the pandemic that I think really need to be addressed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sarah, how about yeah. you? How about me? What do you think about that? You surviving okay? Yeah, for sure. I mean, both, as I said, Rebecca and I go pretty far back and um, one of, but, you know, so it's, it was about adapting, I guess, from my perspective, the curatorial process. When, when she first asked me to be the curator for the show, I was very excited and I thought, oh, you know, go up to Philadelphia, I'll stay in overnight, I'll hang out with her cabinet of curiosity, and then we can sort of talk about, you know, the kinds of works that would capture what she, some of these collaborations, because there've been so many and across so many different topics, if you will. So, so I had this whole fantasy about how it was gonna work. And then as I said, when the pandemic hit, we couldn't do that anymore. And I'm definitely one of these hands-on curators. I mean, I like to spend hours uh, asking an artist how something is made because I, I firmly believe that the process of making something is also very important to the message of something. Mm -hmm. And if I can't, you know, sort of feel it and touch it and move around it, I feel very sort of my hands are tied behind my back. So, it, you know, we, we adapted and we started doing a lot of these FaceTime um, it's sort of Urzak studio visits and it made a huge difference especially when I pushed her to start doing little videos so I could you know really in my head at least move around it because sort of going back to what I was saying the basic material is 
is mylar, but you know, the paintings, the flat paintings have all this sort of globular paint on top of them. So in their own way, they're not flat either and they're very layered, but what you see literally going on with the sculptures is how layered they are and how intricately the patterns are interwoven. And, um, you know, that that was quite a different process than my typical process doing it this way. And the other thing is, you know, as you mentioned, Jack, I've been doing uh, an exhibition series at the American Center for Physics now over 20 years, two shows a year. And as th this exhibition series looks at the intersection of art and science and sometimes theoretical mathematics. But it's never been a show. There's never been a show in this series that deals directly with what happens with an artist and a scientist when they actually collaborate. You know, what is the fruit of this collaboration? And uh, the show reveal has given me that opportunity to spend time. Can't say, I mean, thank God Rebecca's here because. I would not be able to describe in great detail what some of these the scientific research is about, but I can certainly enjoy the artistic creations, the interpretations that uh, Rebecca has made, you know, of them and has been inspired to make of them. And I think that's sort of the great strength of this show is that you know, some of us all know only all about art and some of us know about science, but this show brings the two together. And I think in a really interesting way. One of the things I wanna mention um, that some people forget, before the invention of the camera, scientists had to be artists. And mm, so yeah. you see these extraordinary paintings and illustrations not done by artists, but by scientists because they needed a way that they could record their observation. Now, what's interesting about this in the 21st century, you know, scientists take a camera and they click and they're on to the next. But when you're Santiago Ramon y Cajal, the father of modern neuroscience, who has this incredible archive of 7,000 drawings, which I got to uh, spend time in, you start realizing that when he's looking under the microscope or when he did, because he's deceased, drawing from the microscope, that, that process of drawing and slowing down and processing what you're seeing and understanding, you can't get that when you just take a photograph. And so I feel that we've lost that incredible creative process um, of drawing you know, your observation. So that to me was a real revelatory insight, you know, dealing, because uh, I, I work a lot in scientific uh, special collections because to me, they're just full of secrets. And when you start going it through these incredibly rich archives, you find out and, and, and you find, and you see all kinds of extraordinary things, so. Great, thank you. Uh, I have a question here from uh, Dr. Melissa Brotman. How do you see the similarities and differences between completing your reveries following the resolution of your brain tumor and the experience of your COVID pieces while the pandemic has not yet been resolved? That's, a, that's an incredible question and it's making me reflect on something. Um, the reverie paintings really caught a moment in time. But what I'd like to share is the fact that creating silent spread was something that I spent a whole year doing. For me, it was a working meditation. And I might continue making these objects until this gets resolved. And what I have found, whenever you do any kind of meditative type of art form, and a lot of people that know my earlier work, I did a lot of wrapping, um, both with wire and rubber and all kinds of materials. Mm -hmm. It becomes this meditation and it enables me personally to process that which I'm going through. Creating those 28 sculptures on a certain level enabled me to get through the pandemic. 
I, I can't describe it, but knowing I was going to get up every morning and continue to cut, crease, um, um, take graphite to rub the surface, it, it was a meditation for me. So two very different things, you know, reverie, I can look back on it and I'm so thankful I have this, um, I've captured this moment in time where I had a unique vision that hopefully I will never have again. Yeah. Um, gave me extraordinary insight. Uh, Margaret Sproston uh, writes, I am in England and I have listened to you talk of North American and English contributors do you think contributions are very individual or have different cultural contributions? Also, thank you so much to bring some beauty and pattern to what has been quite a terrifying time for many of us. Well, thank you very much for that comment. Um, you know, I was raised that you have a glass of water. You can see it either half full or half empty. Um, I, I subscribe to the half full. And I have always in my life, no matter how awful <laughs> experiences have been, I always try to find um, either the kernel of truth or the light um, that can be gleaned from it. Um, I'm curious about the first part of it because um, the fact, um, was it related to scientific discovery in England? Can you or maybe if there is a national, if you can detect a difference between how people, scientists, I guess, in different parts different. of the world express different. themselves. Well, different cultural contributions. Yeah, it's cultural. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it, what's fascinating to me as an artist, most artists work by themselves. I mean, the creating artwork is uh, a solitary type of endeavor. It's not like theater, it's not like music, and even science. What's fascinating to me about science is you have scientists from all over the world that collaborate you know, on trying to figure out something. Um, and what's so interesting to me is the fact that so, sometimes I find that science is so siloed because people are experts in one field that I think when I, and I do a lot of lecturing to scientists, I think they're enchanted by the fact that I can look at something in astrophysics and neuroscience and I can use my work to create a bridge between the two. And I find when I'm talking to a neuroscientist, they're fascinated by insights I bring to them from astrophysics and vice versa or chemistry. Uh, and that's the gift of an artist. I think a, a, an artist has that ability to be a, build, a, a, a bridge builder between these different disciplines. Uh, I'm a, a materials person like Sarah. Uh, Cindy Schwartz writes, did you have issues getting supplies to create your art during the pandemic? If so, did you find other items to use and what were they? No, I'm a Mylar type of gal. I've been working with Mylar probably 30, 35 years. Um, most people don't know it's Mylar. That's the magic of it, um, yeah. is trying to transform it. And I stockpile. I'm obsessive about always making sure. <laughs> and I didn't grow out of the 40. depression. I, I just, I was intuitive. I think I sensed something was coming down the pike. And then the wonder of Amazon, you know, it, you know, it's really amazing what you can get online. Um, so that sort of gave me hope that I wouldn't run out of things. Yeah. Running out of cookies and ice cream, that was something else. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is quite uh, startling uh, to look at what you've accomplished, uh, what those, those works all on Mylar, I mean, particularly the ones just with graphite and Mylar. Yeah. Oh my God. You know, I mean, I don't want to say you're obsessed, but uh, what would you call it? <laughs> it's a working meditation. <laughs> it's an obsessive. No, yeah. but the other thing that's amazing is, is that they seem so delicate, you know? Um, 
in contrast to say the scientific models, which is they're usually made out of either drawing on paper, right? Or they're like plastic and you've created a sort of fluttering sense and then combined with shows a soundscape, you really get this sense of um, kind of ethereal movement. Um, Maybe that's how the meditation comes in, actually. I never thought about that. Well, you know, it was interesting because Show was insistent that I photograph every single one. And I right. said, Show, they're all the same. <laughs> and I did. He made me photograph with my iPhone. They were all a little different. They all had slightly different nuances to them. And it, that made me feel good because, you know, when you spend every single day of a year creating something, um, you're, you're imbuing it with a certain part of your spirit, you yeah. know, and your insight. And for me, that's what that piece was about. Um, it was a silent spread and mm -hmm. literally was spreading in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have a, uh, a suggestion about uh, housekeeping um, from Margaret Sproston. You should read Jenny Moon's work on ref reflection from Exeter University, England, and start drawing her cognitive housekeeping ideas, as I do not think people want to think of housekeeping as helping science and art. Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, wow. I think you can learn from anything and, you know, any repetitive type of thing like house cleaning. It, it, it's just, um, it, it's, it's a walking meditation. And, and not only that, but you're clearing your space. And mm -hmm. so I would think from that point of view, that would be a very significant thing to um, research. Very good. I think I could probably, you know, Jack, in the 70s, I probably could have gotten an NEA grant uh, <laughs> to do that. So no, I'm just kidding. But um, I think that actually, I think that's an interesting idea. I'd like to take a look at that book. Thank you for that suggestion. Beth Fisher writes, congratulations on such a wonderful exhibit. The breath voice really brought a visceral impact to the display. Did it have a strong impact on you when you first heard it? It did, yeah. it did, because you know, you hear from the scientists and, and thank you, Beth. Beth is one of my collaborating partners from the Rocky Mountain Lab. Um, what's interesting, and I think it, it would be an interesting question to ask her, obviously she was impacted by it. She's looking at the virus through a microscope, but she's seeing the cause of this. But other scientists are studying the impact to the body, which is breathing. So my role was to sort of bring yeah. these two things together. What I was understanding about the impact it had on the body and best beautiful microscopy images of the virus itself. So. <clears throat> Good. Uh, I think we're getting towards the end here. Uh, are there any uh, maybe final uh, questions or uh, observations you have to make to uh, each other? I want to know what Rebecca's, what, what the biggest takeaway for you was from doing this project. And like, has it spurred some new ideas for you? Actually, it has. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just... I'm still trying to process the experience. Uh, I, you can probably tell I'm in my studio. Maybe you don't know I'm, I'm in my studio. I've never been in my studio when I have a blank canvas. Every single wall is a blank canvas. So um, I'm very excited about, um, I'm very interested at the moment in quantum mechanics. Um, I've always been very interested in the relationship between the micro and macro. Um, and how there's a dynamics that shared, like even with the corona, with the, um, the sun's corona and the coronavirus. So um, I'm doing some research right now um, where I'm investigating some things having to do with quantum gravity. So um, I have no idea where it's gonna take me, but I always 
face it with an open mind and an open heart. And I think when you, when you face life in that way, all things are truly possible. Um, I want to uh, uh, give a shout out to uh, Chelsea Anderson who's yeah. been working behind the scenes here, making this all work and uh, not let us go crazy, you know, with <laughs> difficulties. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, thank you. And thank you, uh, audience, for uh, coming tonight. And I do hope you'll come to the museum. It's really an, an extraordinary exhibition and experience. And we have parking, so come on. <laughs> and I, I just want to thank everyone. I want to thank Jack and his extraordinary exhibition staff. I mean, to, to mount an exhibition in a pandemic um, has been challenging and, and your staff made it go yeah. with ease. And I yeah. am so full Enjoy. of gratitude. I'm yeah. so full of gratitude to Sarah for joining me on this journey and all these yeah. extraordinary scientists who were willing to partner up with an artist and see what might be possible. Uh, yes. Rebecca, are you, willing, are you willing to share your contact information? We have, uh, we have several people who would like to know how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. Through my website would probably be the easiest, yeah. What, what is that website? www.rebeccacayman.com. Okay. Uh, well, thank you both so much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.